You may be seated. At home, you can sit down now. You can sit down now. Hallelujah. Well, listen, we know you're here. We're so thankful that you're here and watching. Come on, we, we greet this way. Come on, get those elbows out. Just hit the person on your right and on your left and say, it's so good to see you in church today. That's the sanitary way of saying I love you in Jesus. That's what that is. Times Square Church, we have people joining us from almost 100 nations all over the world. Can you give them a hand clap and welcome all those that are watching from all over? Thank you. Thank you for watching and thank you for being here. There's a certain church in the southern part of the United States that dramatically and tragically had a church split. In fact, the split was so bad they filed a lawsuit with the city that they were in, city of millions of people, and this church couldn't figure it out and filed a lawsuit. The judge finally sent the, the matter back to their denomination and the church court assembled together, took both sides and gave the church property. They're fighting over property. Gave the church property to one side and then the other side got so angry they started a church on another side of the city. And during the church hearing, the church council learned that the conflict all began, don't miss this, at a church dinner when an elder, listen up elders, when an elder received a slice of ham that wasn't big enough as the child next to them. That's when it started. They were fighting over ham instead of fighting the real fight of faith. Ephesians 6.12 says that we're not fighting against people made of flesh and blood. But against persons without bodies, the evil rulers of the unseen world, those mighty satanic beings and great evil princes of darkness who rule this world against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the, in the spirit world. And the church, this church is in a city with millions of people that need Jesus and God's army is fighting over ham. The warning against ham fights, not David ham, the warning against ham fights came 3,000 years ago in a little Old Testament book. And it was a challenge, listen Times Square Church, to be angry about the right things. Not to major in the minors, but to major in the majors. And the lesson is found in the book of Jonah. That many of us have learned the sea lesson that Jonah learned but today we're going to learn the land lesson. Today we're going to talk about Jonah, the sea lesson. Jonah needed a whale, but that's not all he needed for God to get him in the place he was supposed to be. And we are going to see not only a sea lesson today, but more importantly, we're going to learn the land lesson today that mostly gets overlooked, that has to deal with majoring in the minors and not doing what God's asked us to do. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I ask you in Jesus' name, that you would come to this place today and speak to us. May the Holy Spirit guide these next few moments. We thank you for all those that are watching around the country, around New York City, around the tri-state area, and even around the world. We pray right here on 51st and Broadway, over in every living room and dining room, in every car, as people are listening on a podcast, even on a non-Sunday, Lord God. We pray, Holy Spirit, speak powerfully, and we pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen, amen. Okay, let's get ready. Billy Graham said this. He said, I have no problem believing that the whale swallowed Jonah. In fact, in fact, he said, I would have even believed if Jonah had swallowed the whale. He says, why? He says this, give me Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the rest of the Bible poses no problem for me. If you believe in Genesis, you can believe in the stories around the word of God. Because if he can create a heaven and an earth out of nothing, then folks, he can do whatever he wants to do. If you mention Jonah, we always associate him with one thing, and that is a whale. But there are some people here that are purists and say, it doesn't say whale, I get you. It says great fish, and we'll cater to you for about three seconds. But listen, it's a miracle story of a man that was able to get a second chance on an assignment of God that he initially ran from. It's also a miracle story about a city with 100,000 people 
that had no chance, full of wicked people that experiences revival and the entire city comes to Christ. Jonah did not go to Nineveh church because in the beginning on the first call, because he was prejudiced. Listen, he felt God, this Jewish prophet felt that God was only for the Jews and was upset that God was expanding the borders of salvation and saying, I'm not a God of the Jews. I'm the God of every living thing that's out there. And I want to bring in Jews and Gentiles. And his heart, Jonah's heart was not open to non-Jewish people. He was a prophet with a very narrow view of the world. In fact, Jonah, before he even saw the Nineveh people or heard them, has already prejudged them. But thank God the Lord vetoed it. You know, I learned something this week. Pastor Carter, and what an incredible word he spoke last week on I Had a Dream. But Pastor Carter said something very powerful to me. Listen to what Pastor Carter said. He said, you don't need the Holy Spirit to hate people, but you do need the supernatural power of God to love people. What he was saying was this. Listen, jot this down. You need God to love people, but you can hate people all by yourself. You don't need the supernatural power of God. I was doing a podcast this week for the, for the founding pastor of this church, David Wilkerson, for his son, Gary Wilkerson. And Gary Wilkerson asked me a very interesting question. He said, when did a love for seeing people get born again what, of what you do at the end of every service for people that are getting born again here in 51st and Broadway and all over the world? When did you realize that every person you come in contact with is a candidate for heaven? And I remember going, telling Gary this week, I said, Gary, that's a great question. In fact, it's making me think of a story that, man, I haven't thought about for almost 40 years. I said, Gary, the reason why I have a heart for that is because of you. He said, me? I said, Gary, when I left Baylor University to come to Detroit on a summer's missions trip, the very first person that took me out on the streets of Detroit, going from Waco to the inner city of Detroit, the very first person that took me out on the streets was Gary Wilkerson. I was witnessing with Gary on the streets of Detroit. And I'll never forget, because this was the most important part that started to put this inside of me, because I became a little bit of like Jonah. I just finished my freshman year on a summer's missions trip, and now on the most dangerous city in America, carrying a David Wilkerson book called Rock Bottom. And we were walking down the street, and one of the first people we, we encountered was this very large man with two women underneath each arm, with a woman under each arm. And my first inclination when I saw that was to go to the other side of the street when I saw that. That was called wisdom. <laughs> Not Gary Wilkerson. He walked straight up to this man who was a pimp walking with two prostitutes and gave them this book called Rock Bottom. That man looked at it, realized it was about Jesus, and threw it on the ground. That's good enough for me to move to the other county across the city. Not Gary Wilkerson, that spirit of Wilkerson, all of a sudden picks it up and gives it to the girls. If you're gonna reject it, I'll give it to the girls. They started to look at it, he ripped it out of his hand and threw it to the ground. And I thought the miracle was we didn't die. But I didn't realize there was another miracle that was coming. The next night, our staff was eating in our staff residence and the doorbell rings and the two ladies that were under his arm were replaced by two senior citizen ladies now holding the arms of the pimp and were saying to us, when I opened the door, I, it, was, it was scary and these two old ladies in their 70s are holding the pimp by his arms and going, he got saved. He got saved, he got saved. I said, Gary, at that point, I realized God can save anyone he wants to save. And everybody is a candidate of heaven. God can do that. See, Jonah hated Nineveh because he already prejudged them like I did that young man that was walking down the street. If you grew up in the church or know anything about church, there's two stories you knew. If it wasn't about Jesus, it was about David and Goliath, and it was Jonah and a whale. Those are the two stories that you knew. It was the story of Jonah who ran from God, 
who prejudged these people in Nineveh ends up in the belly of a great fish. And the Bible says in Jonah chapter two, praise, doesn't pray the whole story until he gets in the worst situation, praise in the belly of the fish and God turns the whole situation around. And if you have children that grew up in the early 2000s, you realize that there was a gospel choir in the belly of that whale that helped him. If you don't know what that means, it's called Veggie Tales. And so at that point, at that point, Jonah begins to get spit up on the, on the, on the sand. And the Bible says in Jonah 3.1 that the word of the Lord came to him a second time. And it seems that the book of Jonah should have ended happily ever after at Jonah 3.10. Jonah gets to his assignment. 120,000 people become born again. And you think that the amazing story should be over. But listen, Times Square Church. Listen, those who are watching online. That's not the end of the story. That's just the water lesson. There's a land lesson that it was on its way. See, Jonah needed a fish. Get it, church but he also needed a plant to get him on track. And I'm gonna explain this because we think the story's over at the whale, but God needed to get something else and get something at him. My first cell phone was a Motorola Razor, a flip phone. Some of you still have a flip phone. God help us all. And so we, we had a Motorola Razor. And let me just tell you what happened. And the thing that just came out at this time was individualized ringtones that you can take a song or you can take anything from on from online and like through 50 steps, download a ringtone on it. Now it just it's literally you could blink and the ringtone is on it. So our tech people put a ringtone on mine. So I was preaching on a Tuesday night in this converted triple X theater in Detroit. And in the middle of the message coming to the altar call somewhere in the middle of the church, I start hearing a theme song from TV while I'm preaching. It's from the, it's from the TV show cops. And I'm hearing this song, bad boys, bad boys, bad boys. And folks, listen, I've preached here. And some of your phones, you didn't put it on silent. We know who you are. And so I just, as we're, we, and and I'm listening and I'm going like, why won't they turn it off? Why won't they turn the phone off? And all you hear is bad boys, bad boys, bad boys. And I'm going, this is unbelievable. I wish that. And then it dawned on me. It's my phone. I'm going, I'm the bad boy. That's my phone. And I had to stop the service and say, folks, it's in my jacket. Can someone put my phone on silent? Here's what I've learned. The writer of Amazing Grace, John Newton, back in the 16th century said this, when people are right with God, they're more inclined to be hard on themselves and easy on people. But when they're not right with God, they are easy on themselves and hard on everybody else. Keep keep that on the screen for a second because some of you need to pull your phone out and take a picture of that right now. Because when you're right with God, you start with you before you start. I started with 900 seats in in this church before I started with the man that was the problem. And Jonah started with Nineveh instead of dealing with himself. And this is what's amazing is that the problem in the book of Jonah, you ready for this church? Wasn't the sinners. It was the prophet. That was the, there it is. Didn't even take a second. Thank God it's not bad boys. Okay, listen for a moment. And what's amazing is that the problem in the book of Jonah wasn't the sinners. It wasn't Nineveh. It was the prophet. But the prophet thought it was Nineveh. It was kind of like the ringtone issue. And what's amazing to me is when you read those four chapters of the book of Jonah, this is what I've learned. Everything in the book of Jonah obeys God except the prophet of God. Everything obeys God. When you start to read it, this is what's amazing about this. When you read it, the fish obeys God, the plant in chapter four, the worm in chapter four, the wind obeys God, but not the prophet obeying God. Everybody obeys God except Jonah. 
And this is what blows me away, is that when you begin to realize how this land lesson is important to us, it's not just important for us personally, but even as a church. Listen carefully. It's easier to walk on water once than to walk on land all the other days of your life. Okay, let me explain it to you like this. Walking on water is a miracle. Walking on land, that's kind of the Christian life. And here's what I think about. Peter walked on water, but he denied Jesus on land. That you can get your miracle, but forget you have the other days of the week that you have to obey God. See, the water and the whale is the miracle lesson in the book of Jonah. That's the miracle. That's the walking on water part. But it's the plant, the worm, and an east wind in chapter 4 that we're going to deal with. That's the Christian life lesson that I think is so important for all of us. His ocean le- lesson was epic. A big fish, a second chance, and a revival in a city that never would have expected it. But here's what I started to realize when I read this book and started to ask God to even touch us today, and that's this. God will deal with sinners, and God will deal with his people. That before God even speaks, and people are going like, God's going to judge America. Be careful, because he starts with the house of God first. That's what we forget. So when you start asking for judgment, you're asking God, start with me. Because then you start removing chapter 4 from Jonah. See, God will deal with Nineveh, and God will deal with Jonah. And that's why Jonah chapter 4 is the land lesson. It's God dealing with Jonah. David Wilkerson, the founder of Times Square Church, gave me a book many, many years ago from an old Scottish preacher named Alexander White. The name of the book was called Bible Characters of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is, it is a treasure on reading about Bible characters. And, Bible. and this is what Alexander White said about Jonah. He said the prophet Jonah was both the elder son and the unmerciful servant of the Old Testament. What, what do you mean, Pastor Tim? He's the eldest son from the story of the, from the two parables of Jesus. He's the eldest son in the story of the prodigal son that when a young boy comes out of a pig pen, gets right with God, you have a brother that couldn't even be happy. And he's the unmerciful servant that gets forgiven of this huge debt, but when it's called upon him to forgive someone, he couldn't forgive anybody. And he says this is this so, so profoundly, he goes, that's who Jonah is. He's like the older brother, and he's like the unmerciful servant. He was given a second chance. Think about this. Jonah just escaped death from the, from the ocean and the belly of a fish. Jonah saw revival in an entire city, Times Square Church, he should be the most grateful and the most joyful prophet in all of Israel. But chapter four, the land lesson starts off so sadly. I want to read it to you because this is the chapter I want us to see. And I want to spend just a few moments here today as we go through this. Listen to Jonah chapter four. This is the way it starts. But to Jonah, this seemed wrong, the revival. And he became angry. The Bible says this, In verse 2, he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, listen to what he says. This is a little bold. Take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Better for me to die than to see all these people get saved. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Now, here's the part that's so sad. Jonah had gone out, sat down at a place east of the city of Nineveh, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen to the people in that city. Folks, just for a moment, how sad are those words? Jonah went out from the city and sat and sulked. Think about it. You just had 120,000 people saved, and you leave the people, the new converts that needed a new believers class, that needed your gift and needed your relationship with God, and you leave them there because it didn't happen your way. Ooh, Pastor Tim, you're preaching now this morning. I'm telling you. Because it didn't happen the way you scripted it, Jonah. Now you sit and sulk when your gift is needed in Nineveh with 120,000 people because it didn't happen your way. So now you're angry. You're sitting there. Get, get ready for this. And I'm going to explain this at the end. And now because you're sitting and sulking, 
Now you just put a question mark on what your future is going to be. Let me say that one more time. And I'll, I'll prove that part to you in a second. He sits and sulks because it didn't happen. They need his gift, but he's angry sitting there. And now we're waiting. What's his future going to be? Because he just put a question mark there. You know what the C lesson is in the book of Jonah? Obedience is hard, but disobedience is much harder. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? It's much easier to obey God the first time rather than needing a second chance with the bumps and bruises from the fish, from the fish journey there. I, we, we had yesterday, Treg and our, and our missions department um, yesterday did our Child Cry Harvest Market right here on 51st. It was amazing. I met some of the greatest people in Times Square Church. We were talking and hearing their story. And I got permission from Walter to tell his story. I asked Walter, I said, Walter, when did you come to the church? He said, 2009, but I was supposed to be there in 2000. He said, when I showed up nine years later, I showed up with bumps and bruises because I didn't listen the first time. I said, you sound like Jonah. <laughs> and Walter goes, yep. He said, in 2000, after I became a Christian, I was in a library and a librarian said to me, you need to go to Times Square Church. I did what I wanted to do, came nine years later, and I wish I would have listened nine years earlier. It's amazing that obedience is hard sometimes, but listen, church, listen online, listen, but disobedience is much harder. What was, what was Jonah's land lesson? Okay, C lesson is this. Obedience is hard, but disobedience is much harder. I just want to get where God wants me with the least amount of bumps and bruises that I can do. Anybody with me on that? Okay, here's the land lesson that I want us just to look at for a few moments. Here it comes. He's sitting and sulking. Let's go to verse 6, and here's how it starts. Jonah 4, 6 says this. So the Lord God appointed a plant. So he gets, it's, it's interesting. In Jonah chapter 1, it says God appointed a fish. Now it says God appointed a plant. Here it comes. Because Jonah needed a fish and Jonah needed a plant. And it grew up over Jonah to be shade over his head. Now he's happy to deliver him from his discomfort. Now he's comfortable. I'm in the shade. And Jonah was extremely, this is the part that gets me. He's extremely happy. I'm about to, I'm going like, bro, come on. 120,000 people just got saved, but you're happy about a plant? Extremely happy? about a plan. Someone's got problems. Okay. I'm just telling you. Verse seven. <laughs> this is awesome. But God appointed a worm. <laughs> get ready. Cause soon as you get comfortable, you're going to about to get some worms, not just for your dog, but for you too. God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day. It attacked the plant and it withered. It came about that when the sun uh, came up that God appointed the fourth appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so he became faint begged with all of his soul now he wants to die again twice in the chapter death is better to me than life he says verse 9 God's about to speak then God said to Jonah do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant he said, and he said, I have a good reason to be, this is talking back to God. I'm, if I'm next to Jonah, I'm going to go like, yeah, bro, you're, it's about over now for you at this point. And then it says, the Lord said, you had compassion on a plant. He said, for which you did not work for. You didn't cause it to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. And then he says, and you should, he says, and should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city, there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as the animals. Folks, I want you to jot this down because here's the land lesson that God spoke to him. Get this down. The land lesson is this. You had compassion on a plant, but you couldn't have compassion on Nineveh. He said, and, that, and that's the simplicity of it. Really, if I could say it this way, you had misplaced emotions. You got angry about the wrong thing. You like a church in the, in the South of the United States that's getting angry about ham and you have Jonah getting angry about a plant instead of getting the emotions for 120,000 lives. 
God was saying to Jonah, God was saying to that church in the southwest part of the United States, be upset about the right things. Be upset about the right things. The land lesson is this. You're passionate about the wrong thing. You're fighting for a plant and you're not fighting for 120,000 souls. You're missing the big picture is what he was saying. I've seen, listen time scriptures, I've seen churches fight about plants on a stage. I've seen churches fight over carpet colors and wall colors. I've seen churches fight over Christmas trees in the lobby. They will fight to get what they want. They're angry if it's gone. They're happy if it's there, but never shed a tear or give a shout when somebody is born again and living for Jesus. I want to be happy and angry about the right things. See, Jesus faced the same issue with the religious people of the New Testament. Remember, how many remember this phrase? You're straining a gnat and swallowing a camel. How many remember that phrase? Let me, let me, Jesus was saying you're majoring in the minors. Let me read it to you out of a power phrase. This is what Jesus said. This is powerful. Great sorrow, Jesus' words, great sorrow awaits you religious scholars and Pharisees. You're frauds and pretenders. You're obsessed with peripheral issues, majoring on the minors like insisting on paying meticulous tithes on the smallest herb that grow in your garden. And Jesus said, those matters are okay. I want you to, be, I want you to do that. Yet you ignore the most important duty of all. Walk in the love of God. Display mercy to people and to live with integrity. And then Jesus says this, readjust your values and place first things first. Listen, he goes, what blind guides, the paraphrase says, you nitpickers. You'll spoon out a gnat from your drink, and yet at the same time, you'll gulp down a camel without even realizing it. Can I just tell you something, Times Square Church? Let's fight for 100 million people. Let's fight for people that are all around us. I'm not here to fight for songs. Listen, I have preferences. When this, and some of you do also, I grew up in the church. And so whether you're singing a hymn or gospel, you got my heart. Some people are saying, I want the hymns. And some people are going, I want hill song. Some people want gospel. And then you have some people want Jewish songs. Let me just tell you something. Whether you have a shofar and a prayer shawl or a modesty cloth and a lap cloth, I don't care whether you jump up and down or you cut a step. The issue is I don't want to be a plant person. I don't want to be emotional about a style of song. I want to be emotional that people are being born again by the power of Jesus Christ. That's what I want God to do. That's what we're called to do. I'm not fighting for style. I'm not fighting for plants or preferences. Let's fight for Nineveh. Let's fight for New York City. Let's fight for the masses that they would come to know Jesus Christ. You know what I... When I, I heard something this week and I started praying and I just saw it. I saw it in my heart. I was listening to someone tell me the story of people that are watching the service on a phone and weeping and coming back to God that never would walk through the doors of this church. But they would, they would get it on the phone and weep and come to God. And I grew up at a time that you count the people that came to the altar, that it didn't count unless you saw them come down here. Can I just help you today? You don't have to see anybody as long as God sees them. That's the issue. That's the issue. You know what I saw in my heart as I started to pray for those that will never see, that will never maybe have a chance to come here? I saw in my heart people in the Middle East. I want you to listen to me. You may be from Northern Africa, from a Middle Eastern country where it's illegal to be a Christian, where there's persecution. I believe I saw in my heart people watching our service by phone, weeping in a closet so no one would know, AirPods in, thinking to themselves, God is helping me, God is touching me, God is feeding me. That's who we're fighting for, folks. I'm not fighting for a plant. We're fighting for souls. Pastor Carter told me, he said, Nikki Cruz, when he was in Tanzania, he said, there are a thousand a thousand orphans in a park in Tanzania that watch Times Square Church on cell phones every single Sunday. What are we fighting for? We need hymns. We need hill songs. We need Jewish songs. We need suits. We need time. We need souls to be saved. 
We need God to save souls. We need God to do that. Well, I want to think masses. Oswald J. Smith said it like this. Any church that is not seriously involved with helping to fulfill the Great Commission has forfeited its biblical right to exist. Folks, I want to go down winning as many people as we can to Christ. That's why we exist for the Great Commission. I don't even know if you know this. One of the greatest American evangelists, Charles Finney, built a 2,500-seat church, you ready for this, on 86th and Broadway. It was called Broadway Tabernacle. Charles Finney, one of the great American evangelists, had a church on the Upper West Side. And here's what I loved about Charles Finney. It says this. It says, he would never let anyone preach in his church unless they were a soul winner. And for this reason, Proverbs 11.30 is what it says. He who wins souls is wise. He says, why would I let a fool in the pulpit? I need wise people to preach. And that's why he wouldn't put them up there. Do you know what happens, folks? Do you know what happens when we get upset about the wrong things? Listen carefully. I, 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 it's, it's, it goes like this. It's the, think of the Marines that are trained to fight. And here's what's amazing. If they're trained to fight and they're not on the battlefield, and you give them a weekend pass, they're trained to fight. You know what they end up doing? They, end up, they have to beat up somebody because they're trained that way. So they end up beating up each other in a bar over the weekend because they're not fighting the enemy. And when we're not fighting the enemy, we start fighting each other. That's exactly what begins to take place. And that's why I believe I, I want to move away. I want to move away from being a plant person. You know, can I just give you just two quick thoughts and then we'll close? Here's, here's one step. I, I, I want to I learn how to serve instead of being served. I want to serve instead of learning how to be served. I was at Summit last week and talked to two young students that were there because of connect groups, because somebody served in a connect group, one from London and one from the Dominican Republic. And they said, we're here today because of the London connect group and because of the DR Child Cry connect group. Think how amazing that is. Some of you are going like, I'm not comfortable with connect groups. That's a plant. <laughs> Let it go. That what we need to do is simply goes like this. Is I would tell you right now, wherever you are, go ahead and just check out tsc.nyc forward slash groups. It's serving the next generation. That when that couple in London is doing a connect group, you know what happens? They don't even realize that there is a teenager, there is a young person in there that's going to end up in Bible college for the next generation. They don't even realize in the DR, in the Dominican, and wherever you're watching, whatever country you're from, God may be calling you. And you may be right here from Connecticut, Long Island. Yes, there could be connect groups in Long Island. It could be anywhere. We just got to make sure that God, that we're serving and not just always wanting to be a consumer. But here's the second thing. It's self-evaluation when we get emotional about something. Every single time Jonah gets upset, I, I want to die. It goes like this. Uh, we're not going to do it this way. I quit. <laughs> Woo, Pastor Tim. That's why it's taken us a while to come back to this church. <laughs> I don't want to take a whole chapter fighting over a plant. Life is too precious. Give me Jonah 4, and how about a chapter of rejoicing? I don't want to fight over plants and ham. I want to fight over souls that need to be saved. And the challenge for Jonah is the challenge for all of us. It's, not the, it's, it's what all of us get challenged with. Personal preference over God's heart. Personal preference over God's heart. Fighting for a city. Fighting for the 8 million people here. Fighting for, think about this, 500,000 people in a 10-block radius. It's fighting for them. Or do we fight over plants? Do we fight over those things? God is bringing us into a chapter four. I want our chapter four to be full of joy. I want our chapter four to be full of souls being saved. I read this. Let me just tell you this, and I believe it. What makes a good church? It's not stage. It's not lights. It's not Broadway. 
It's not music. It's not plants. It's not carpeting. This is what I love. Someone said it like this. What makes a good church? It's when all the lazy folks get up, all the sleeping folks wake up, all the discouraged folks cheer up, the gossiping folks shut up, the dishonest folks confess up, the estranged folks make up, disgusted folks will sweeten up, lukewarm lukewarm folks will fire up, dry bones will shape up, sanctified folks will show up, leading folks will pay up, true soldiers will stand up. He says, then we're going to begin to wake up, pray up, sing up, teach up, stay up, never give up, never back up, never shut up shut up until Christ is proclaimed all around the world. I want to be that kind of church today. I want God to do that for us today. There are, get this now, let me close here. Let me close here. There are three kinds of believers in the church, believers, unbelievers, and make-believers. There are believers, unbelievers, and make-believers. Okay. Okay, look at me. Look at me. People at home, I know you're, I know you're going like, let's, let's, let's turn this off. Okay, listen. And those who are sitting here, you got to sit here because if you stand up, I'm going to go, hey, make believer. I want two types of people in this church. I want believers and I want unbelievers. Those are the only two. You know what the make believers are? They're going to fight over the things that don't mean anything. They're going to fight for a preference and sit there and sulk. And instead of going like, let's lift our hands and thank God for people that are getting born again. Let's believe that every seat is going to be a believer and an unbeliever in this place. As the band comes, the book of Jonah says, God prepared four things to make Jonah who he had to be and who he was to be. Four things. It says, God prepared a great fish. God prepared a plant. God prepared a worm, and God prepared an east wind. All four of those things needed to be part of Jonah's life, not just the fish. You know what the fish did? The fish got him there, but the other three things, you know what those things, three things did? God is, we're, we're a challenge for a depth, because to be in a place without the heart being there, that's sabotage. And that's why when you look at this, a great fish to get you back in the will of God and to pray again, a plant to comfort Jonah in extreme heat. It's a gift from God. But before you can just start getting happy about the plant, it's the worm to remind us that our happiness is not based on circumstances. It could be gone immediately. And an east wind to really, in a sense, to do what the fish did, to get a man talking to God again. The east wind, the great fish, got Jonah talking again. All those things are from God. I read this this week by the by the Chicago pastor, Alan Redpath, who pastored Moody Church. Listen to what he said. He said, there's no circumstance, no trouble, no testing that can ever touch me until first it's gone past God and past Christ right through to me. And if it comes to me that, if it comes that far, then it has great purpose, but I may not understand it at the moment. That if you're facing worms that are eating up stuff and you're facing scorching winds and you're facing, this is so powerful. It says it had to go through God and Christ in order to get to me. And if it's gone that far, then God said, saw fit to do something deep inside of me. That's what he was doing. That's what God was doing. So here's how we end. Did all that work? Did the, the fish, the plant, the worm, did the wind, did it all work? There is this crazy thing that you'll see sometimes, whether it's on the little ticker tape under ESPN, if you're reading in the newspaper in a sports sections, when it comes to races, there's a phrase and it's DNF, DNF. Those three letters deal with the races of humans, animals, and even cars. It's attached to a name of a participant that started, but didn't finish. In fact, DNF, DNF means did not finish. A blown engine, a pulled hamstring, cramping. America was saddened when, when, when Simone Biles pulled out of the Olympics, DNF. When Naomi Osaka, number one tennis player in the world, pulled out of the, of the Olympics in tennis instead of going for the gold, DNF. And I'm not sure if Jonah got a DNF. Nobody knows. You know why? Because Jonah is the only book in the Bible 
that ends with a question mark. You read it for yourself. God speaks, ends with a question mark, and we really don't know what Jonah's response is or what Jonah's end is. But here's what I want to tell you today. You don't have to leave with a question mark of where you're going and of who you are. I want to tell you today, you can leave with an exclamation point. I'm going to heaven. I'm living for Jesus. And I want to walk with God today. Those that are watching online, you can leave with an exclamation point today. Because some people have shown up here today. How was church? Oh, it was okay. Did anything happen? Oh, you know. Talked about plants, worms. <laughs> but what happened? And then all of a sudden there's a question mark. We just don't know. But I'm telling you today, you can know. You can know today. If someone was to ask you, are you going to heaven? I hope so. I think so. I'm telling you, let's change that question mark into an exclamation point today. Pastor Tim, I don't want your story ending that way. And for the Christians that are sitting and sulking, and let's remove that question mark and go, this is about souls today. This is about a hundred million souls. It's not, a, it's not about a plant and it's not about a preference. But the most important is it's about eternity. And those that are sitting in this place, those that are watching online, that's what we're here for. That's why all this, I, listen, I, this is great. These guys are amazing. We love the choir and all of this is great. If it can help us get more souls, count me in. That's why we're here. If connect groups get young people into ministry and connect groups are getting people born again, we just heard, I just, Pastor Carter sent me something today about in Sacramento, one of our connect groups in Sacramento. I, I forgot, I know Treg's here. I think we're over close to 30 different countries that have connect groups from all over the world and over half of the United States. And we heard something from Sacramento going like, you won't believe who's coming and getting delivered and baptized in the Holy Spirit and all this stuff. Hey, then it's worth it for me. Fight over the plants. We're going to fight for souls here. Then Pastor Tim, how does that happen? We're fighting for your soul today. We prayed. We prayed for you. And if you're sitting here or watching online, I want you to know that you're going to heaven. I don't want your life ending with a question mark. Well, Pastor Tim, what do you mean? Here's the most important question I can ask you. And you have, the, you have, you have today the decision to make on what, that, what that's going to be, on what the answer is. And the question is this. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? Born again, what's that? Is that a Times Square church word? No, that's a Jesus word. That's John 3.3. 3. Jesus said it like this. No man can see the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. That's not us. That's not a denominational word. It's not a Times Square church word. It's not Protestant, Catholic. It's, it's not Jewish. It's a Jesus word. And folks, if Jesus says you can't see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again, I believe Jesus. Because look at me. Look at me. If anybody knows the directions to his own home, it's Jesus. Because some of you are sitting here going like, I'm a good person. I haven't killed anybody. I've been water baptized. I've had communion. I've been, I've had, I've been confirmed. I go to the synagogue. I go to the mosque. Can I just tell you something? Those are good, but you've never been to heaven, have you? I think Jesus knows how to get to his own home better than you do today. Well, Pastor Tim, how does that happen? What does born again mean? Okay, here it is. Just as you had a first birth, Physically, Jesus says you need a second birth, spiritually. If you were born physically, many of you in a hospital, Jesus says, this is not a hospital born again. This is something that happens deep inside your soul. How does that happen, Pastor Tim? Here it is. Give me three minutes and we're done. Here it is. It's as simple as A, B, C. What is that, Pastor Tim? Okay, just as we would teach a first grader, the alphabet, I want to do it with you today. A, because each of those letters are going to correspond with something. A, here it comes. Admitting that I'm a sinner. Pastor Tim, what, what is that? That all of us, it's when I get honest, that all of us have a condition called sin. It can't be fixed by a promise. I won't do it again. A program, I'm going to get help. A priest, a pastor. We need help to fix it. I'm broken on the inside. The diagnosis is sin. And I have to start with admitting that I'm a sinner. Or as one 
pastor said, we're not mistakers in need of correction. We're sinners in need of a savior. I don't need a second chance. I need a second birth. Then what, how does that happen? That's the B word. Believe. Believe that God sent his son to fix our sinful condition. Why? Because I couldn't fix it myself. Wouldn't it be kind of ludicrous for God to send his own son to come down here for 33 years, go through the suffering that he did on the cross, rise from the dead, go to heaven, and look at humanity and say, now be good, and then you can go to heaven. It doesn't even make sense. He had to come because we couldn't get there on our own. If it was just a matter of, I'm in church, I'm religious, my parents were religious, it doesn't even make sense that God would send his own son. See, Jesus came and became our sin bearer. He paid the price for us. He died the death we were supposed to die, lived the life that we couldn't live and gave us a reward that we didn't even deserve called forgiveness in heaven. And finally, it's confessing him as Lord. This C word is huge. It's Romans 10, 9 and 10. When you confess Jesus as Lord, you're saying you're the boss now. See, religion says, come to church and sit here for 90 minutes. That's what religion says. A relationship says, I want to talk to you and be with you every single day. That's what Jesus wants. Religion says, come into a building. Well, how do you come into a building that's been closed for 18 months? You don't need a building to live. God wants to be with you every single day. To confess Jesus as Lord and saying, God, now you're in charge of my life. Now your word begins to govern me. You're, you're in charge now. Just as you had a first birth, we have a second birth. I want everybody to bow their head and close their eyes for just a moment here. Just for a moment. If you're watching online, this is the most important question. This is where God begins to change us from the inside out. And you may be sitting here today and say, Pastor Tim, I'm not perfect. I don't know how I could do this. Perfect people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And today you could be forgiven of your sin. Today starts the journey for you today. Starts the journey. And I want you to start your journey today. We're fighting for you. There's people right now, there are Christians that are right here, right now. I can tell you that the first couple rows, these men and women are praying for you that are sitting in these seats. We've prayed over every one of these seats that are in this place. Our staff on Wednesdays has a connect group that pray over the whole, all the seats. I came yesterday. We prayed over all of your seats. We said, God, fill that seat with a person, fill them with the Holy Spirit, change their lives. And if you're here today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'll be the only one looking right now because we can't, because of protocol, have you stand. We're not going to make you come forward, but I will ask you to do this. I'm going to pray a born again prayer. It's not magic. It's not special words. It's just taking those ABCs and saying, God, I want to start a journey with you. I want to be born again. I admit I'm a sinner. I believe that you came for me and I confess you as Lord. Be in charge of my life. I don't want any more bumps and bruises, no more wails, but we're going to rejoice over today what God's going to do. If you're here today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, and we're all going to pray it together. But if you're here and say, I want to start a journey with God today, I want to be born again. Balcony, main floor, without any hesitation, before we pray, if you say, put me in that prayer, Pastor Tim, right now, wherever you're at, I don't care if you came by yourself or with somebody, say, put me in that prayer. Wherever you're at, I want you to hold up your hand right now. Say, put me in that prayer. Hold it up high, because I want to make sure I see every hand. I'm going to start with you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, keep them up. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Balcony, let me see them. Hold them up high. 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Keep them up. 34, 35, 36. That's amazing. 37. Got you over there. We rejoice with that today. Come on. We rejoice with that today, with what God's doing. And if you're watching online, we're clapping for you too. Come on, let's all say this with them today, with these 37 and those that are watching online. Come on, say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it with me. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. 
in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Come on. Hey, if you're with me, we're rejoicing with all those. Stand with me right now. Come on, put your hands together one more time for what God has done today. We thank God. Now listen, if you're in this place, before we sing and close today, if you're watching online, I believe some of you are watching from the Middle East right now. I believe some of you are in a closet, on a phone, ear, AirPods on, so no one knows. I'm gonna tell you, it counts. And God is changing you today. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to text CONNECT to 51000. It's gonna be just next steps so we can help. Come on, all, all, all those 37 that are in here, everyone watching, text CONNECT to 51000. We're just gonna help you on a next step. We'll, we'll, we'll respond to you and give you, and give you help on that. Some of you are gonna start CONNECT groups. Everything happens at 51000. We are going, we are going to close today with just, just singing with the, with the worship team. But here's what I want to tell you. If you're here today and you need extra prayer, this is what we do with our teams. We'll have them up here. We'll bring you down. We'll pray for you. We have some social distancing. If you need any personal prayer, if you're watching online going up, but I'm not there. We have online hosts that are praying with you right now. So if you type in a prayer request, an online host is going to respond and pray. And here's what's amazing. Whether we type the prayer or you hear the prayer, it counts. Don't let any plant people tell you that it doesn't work. God works. He works online and he works in the building. How many believe that today? Come on. Hey, can we sing this? Come on. Let's sing with our team and let's rejoice in God today.